Hello everyone, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here, it's a great turnout. We're here to celebrate, to commemorate the sacrifice that our veterans made during the Battle of the Bulge. Today is the 75th anniversary of the start of that battle, and I'm sure most of you know a lot about the battle, a lot more about the battle than I did when we first started organizing the program. Um, I hope, I hope you come away feeling the pride and the gratitude for the sacrifice made for us during the battle. Um, let me just start off the program by talking just a bit about Home Haven. The event has been organized by Home Haven in collaboration with the library. Can everyone hear me? Yes? Great. A little bit better? Okay, a little bit louder. Well, I just thought I would say one sentence about what Home Haven is before we move into the program. Home Haven is a non-for-profit organization here in New Haven that serves Greater New Haven in supporting seniors as they grow older in the comfort of their own homes. Um, Home Haven provides um, educational, uh, social, um, all sorts of support to create a community that is vibrant and active for seniors as they grow older in their homes. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first veteran, Captain Jim Morja, who is here with us today, and he's going to start off the program by singing the Star Spangled Banner. Before, come on up, Captain Morja. Yep, right now. <laughs> Captain Morja is 97 years old. He was born to parents who immigrated to Bridgeport from Italy. In World War II, he fought with the 84th Infantry in Company E. He was awarded the Silver Star for his bravery in the Battle of the Bulge. He earned a master's degree in chemistry from NYU and worked for the Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation until he retired. He's here with us today, and we're so grateful. Or 
for the land and of the free and the hope of the Um, we next have Troy Paddock, who is a professor of modern European history at Southern Connecticut State University. He received his BA in history and philosophy at Pepperdine University and his MA and PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. Paddock's research interests, research interests focus on modern German cultural and intellectual history with a special interest in propaganda. Here's Dr. Paddock. Thank you. Thanks, you, Elizabeth, for inviting me. It's actually an honor to be here. I'm very excited to hear what the other people have to say. So can you hear me now? Or? No. No. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'll start again. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Elizabeth, for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be here. I look forward to what the other panelists have to say. And in the spirit of that, I'm going to keep my remarks brief. I was asked to give a little bit of context for the Battle of the Bulge, so I'll give a little bit of the big picture. As most of you know, it began 75 years ago today and lasted approximately six weeks. It was Germany's last major offensive, last major offensive in the West, um, and it ultimately, thankfully, failed in no small part to the efforts of people who are here this evening. Um, as a, as a historian of, of Germany, there's always the question of why did Germany even do this, try this battle? Um, apparently, Hitler's generals um, advised against it. Um, and, it. and you can understand why, because even if he had won, and the German objective was to ultimately cross the River Meuse and seize the port of Antwerp, what would they have gained from it? Um, honestly, in the long run, not a lot. They would have slowed down the Allied offensive in the West, um, but it would have had no, no effect on the Eastern Front, which was still rolling mercilessly towards Berlin. And so in, in some respects, um, the Germans were more fortunate that they lost the war, that they lost the Battle of the Bulge rather than won it. Because it is very easy to imagine that if the Germans had been successful on the Western Front, that the collapse of Germany would have been completely at the hands of the Soviet Union. And instead of a divided Germany at the end of World War II, we would have had a united Germany at the end of World War II, but united under the influence of the Soviet Union. And post-war history would have taken a dramatically different turn. And I think, actually, in the spirit of that, that's all that I want to say about this. Um, I, it is my pleasure. To introduce Sergeant Louis Celentano, uh, Celentano, excuse me, Celentano, Sergeant Celentano is 98 years old and a New Haven native. native. He is the um, child of immigrants from Italy. He fought in World War II with the 120, uh, 125th Tank Destroyer Battalion. He was awarded the Bronze Star for his bravery in the Battle of the Bulge. He has been featured in a documentary of film about the Battle of the Bulge, which we will see in just a moment, this eight-minute clip. He has recently been honored by the Amity Club of New Haven as a distinguished Italian-American community leader. And he will be available for, he will be part of our round table after the film and part of the discussion, so you can ask him questions about the film and his experiences. to ask uh, 
uh, Sergeant Celentano questions in the general Q&A after the program. Now I'd like to introduce our first storyteller. Um, Arnie Pritchard earned his PhD in history from Yale University. When Pritchard inherited his father's army footlocker, he found letters to and from home, medals, pictures, and mementos of his father, Anton Pritchard's time as a soldier during World War II. Arnie's oral interpretation of his father's letters about this business of fighting shows the passions, hopes, and fears of the soldiers on the front lines. Arnie? Okay. Okay. Hi, how, how's this for people hearing and back? Okay. Um, yeah, this, what you're going to hear is part of a longer story, uh, and if anybody wants to hear the whole thing, talk to me afterwards. But uh, what I'm going to do here is just one letter which shows my father's, I think, frame of mind just before he went into combat for the first time, and this is actually several months before the Battle of the Bulge, but it, it sort of sets the stage. And then I'm going to jump forward to several letters which cover the Battle of the Bulge. He never uses the term, by the way, but that's what he's talking about. Uh, and he's writing home to his parents uh, in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, and the one thing you really need to know, I think, before I get started, is what his specific job was, because it accounts for a lot of his perspective. He was the forward observation officer, sometimes known as the reconnaissance officer, of a battery of artillery. Uh, and what that means, basically, is he's in charge of a small team which spends a lot of its time in the front lines with the infantry, and they've got a radio or a field telephone, and they're basically telling the big guns, which are normally a mile or two behind them, where to fire, uh, how to adjust their fire, whether they're hitting their targets, and generally what they need to do in order to best support the troops in the front lines. Uh, so the important thing is he kind of has a foot in both camps, in the artillery and in the infantry, which accounts for a lot of his perspective. Uh, the, editor, the, the letters are slightly edited, they're slightly abridged, and occasionally I do things like reversing the order of sentences just to make things a little clearer. But I ain't making anything up. Uh, everything there, everything I say is, is there in the original. Okay. So, first letter. July 27th, 1944. France. Dear Mom and Pop, We've been over here for a while now, and I've had ample opportunity to write. But I haven't done so for reasons that I can't fully explain. Suffice it to say that there are many things whose recording would be pointless, because any record would be so inadequate. So far, we've done nothing but take a boat ride to France. I've been to Cherbourg. You will have read about what happened there. It's depressing to see a place so beat up. Everything, everywhere around here is beat up. TNT is a terrible destroyer and there's a monotonous sameness to the look of all ruined buildings. In this hedgerow country, where observation is limited to a few hundred yards, almost every artillery officer has to act as a forward observer, a task second only to that of the infantry. We say that the job separates the men from the boys, and soon, very soon, I'll have the opportunity of determining my own particular slot. So perhaps you can understand why I've not written. There are times in a person's life, it seems, when a little mental wrestling has to be done, and that wrestling just can't be shared with people 3,000 miles away. Try and understand that, will you? But let me set you straight, lest you become alarmed at my maunderings. My health is excellent, I'm eating and sleeping well, and I can still see a joke at every turn in the road. <clears throat> the news of Pop's improvement sure is welcome, and the operation seems to have cleared up an old ill. I was beginning to wonder what the hell was the matter not having heard from you for so long, but as long as everything's okay, you're all forgiven. 
I'm tired, and I gotta get some sleep. The end is in sight, dear people. Until then, for complete details, see your local newspaper. They know much more about this war than we who are fighting it. <laughs> Good night, Anton. P.S. Do you know that I haven't had a real glass of milk since I left the United States? So have about a gallon, good and cold, ready when I get back, okay? Uh, his unit fired its first shots in combat the next day, July 28th. Uh, but I'm going to skip over a whole long section during which he spends some time in combat in France, is wounded in action, spends about three months recuperating from the wound, returns to his unit, uh, in early December 1944, uh, and is eventually involved in the Battle of the Bulge, which he covers really in, the, in what I'm going to what I'm going to do now. February 3rd, 1945, Luxembourg. Dear Mom and Pop, if I don't write for a prolonged period, it becomes harder and harder to pick up the pen and start. And the longer I procrastinate, the harder it becomes to make a beginning. Further, we've been so busy lately with the damn crowds that connected thought has been impossible. Ever present, too, is the problem of writing to people who have no close contact with the war. I've spoken often to this, I know. So often that perhaps you think I regard you as travelers so distant that you cannot comprehend anything that goes on. But when I tell you that even the men in the battery, three or four thousand yards behind the front, have very little idea what the actual fighting is like, perhaps you'll understand my attitude. It's hard to believe, I know. I've talked myself foolish trying to persuade them how easy their lives are compared to the true frontline soldier, but they don't understand. I've put up for months with their whining about the cold and the snow and all the physical and spiritual hardships attendant on this lousy mess. But one of these times, I may just lose control and punch one of them and walk away without a word. It's really a struggle between the animal and whatever good there is in men, this business of fighting. And the closer you get to the point where one guy points his rifle at another guy and pulls the trigger, the more violent that struggle becomes. And the harder it is to preserve even a trifle of human decency and dignity. But it is there, no matter how rough the going. Most often, I believe, it is involuntary. A case in point, several times I've had to restrain myself from helping wounded men. I have stopped to help several times when I really shouldn't have. At the cost of my own men and the infantry whom we happen to be supporting. A specific instance, one afternoon, not long ago, we came into a place right after I'd prepared it with a few volleys, and the 47s, the fighter bombers, had worked it over a little bit. Everywhere there were buildings burning. The GIs were clearing out houses, rifle and machine gun fire all over the place. Then just as we were about through this inferno, the crowd started to shell. It was just a little place, so they could pinpoint it and really pour it on. I was by the company commander's side, moving from one bit of shelter to the next, when we passed a barn, burning, timbers falling, hay burning with a hell of a smoke and smell. And inside that barn were three horses, chained, shifting restlessly as the fire singed their hides. One at a time, I unchained those horses and led them out of the barn. And what for? They weren't my horses, and I'm no great animal lover, and besides that, there were more important things to do. I wouldn't tell anyone of such a thing because they might not understand. Nevertheless, please believe me when I tell you that for myself at least, such actions are completely spontaneous and unpremeditated. That's not what I wanted to say at all, but there it is. In all this, there do seem to be occasional beams of hope and cleanliness. I lately experienced the healing warmth of one of these beams. An axle broke on a truck that was transporting me through the city of Luxembourg. 
and sheer good fortune let me knock on the door of some people I could call friend. I spent two nights in the intervening day with these very good people, the Spiracle family. How good to sit in a lighted room, talking with intelligent people, listening to the radio, and then going to bed between clean white sheets. My only problem was slowing down their constant stream of hospitality. They kept wanting to do something for me. I hope I can see them again. Good night, Anton. February 18th, 1945, Luxembourg. Dear Mom and Pop, in my last letter I promised to tell you how I came to be awarded the Bronze Star. Well, I just finished writing to Leon about it, and the story's getting a little stale in the telling. So I'll be brief this time, if you don't mind. It was some time ago when we were fighting up around Bastogne, and one day I found myself in the woods ahead of town working with Company C of the infantry. My crew consisted of two men, a sergeant and a PFC, a private first class. Both of them were new to the crew. We had no very definite objective, just to clear the stretch of woods in front of us. We joined the does, the infantry, and began pushing forward. Almost simultaneously, the woods became a crashing, roaring bedlam full of mortars and artillery shells and goddamn krauts with schmacers and machine guns. Slowly we pushed forward, my two buckos becoming more and more reluctant to move with each stage, until I was spending most of my time prying them out of holes. The day finally ended somehow, and the three of us fell back about 500 yards from the front line to spend the night in the cellar of an old house in the middle of the woods. Some indication of what the next day would bring came after we'd been in the cellar a few minutes. The two men were talking about what a hell of a rough day it had been, and the sergeant turned to me and said, I'm not going out tomorrow, Lieutenant. I just can't take another day like today. I figured he was pretty tired and didn't know what he was saying. So I told them to get some sleep, and I followed that up with a little pep talk, which I didn't really believe myself. The next dawn I arose, cold and wet and still half asleep. I went to see the infantry company commander about late plans. Then I went back to the house for my two men and the radio. I stood at the top of the cellar steps and called down. All right, boys, time to move out. Let's go. No answer came from the blackness of my feet, so I repeated my call, and back came a sullen, muttered, I'm not going, from the sergeant. Let's cut out this damn foolishness, I said. We've got to get going. Now, let's go. A pause, and again, I'm not going. I tried once more. Do you know what you're saying, Sergeant? Do you understand what those words mean? Again, I'm not going. So I tried the other guy with equally unsuccessful results. Never have I felt so angry and so helpless. It had never entered my mind that a time would come when someone would just flatly quit on me. With my old crew, this never would have happened. Nothing could be done, of course, but to take the radio and go out, go out alone, which I did. And I lugged that radio through the snow all day until I was about ready to drop the damn thing in the snow and give the whole damn business up. So that, substantially, is the story. Like I said to Leon, two men quit on me and so I get a bronze star? Some farce, eh? Good night, Anton. P.S. I just got a Christmas card from the North Providence Service Men's Mothers Club. Jesus. <laughs> March 12th, 1945, Germany. Dear Mom and Pop, 
Maybe now you can understand why I don't write as often as I should. You mentioned the letter that I wrote to Elsa back in January and the troubled tone of that letter. Now that the incident is well in the past, I can look back on it much more calmly than I could at the time of writing. Never had I, have I experienced a session such as we went through at Bastogne. Remember, I had only recently gotten back from the happy haven of England when that holocaust broke loose. The weather was insufferable, great heavy snows, almost paralyzing cold, 9, 10 degrees above zero, so that day and night we were never warm, and that combined with combat excitement almost caused some of us to lose control of our kidneys. Through this we fought, and we fought very hard. Through the endless woods of the Ardennes we crawled through the hip deep snow with all our heavy clothing and all the impedimenta of 20th century war making. And it was during this time that two of my men heaved in the sponge, forcing me to go it alone. But, and this is the only compensating factor, we kicked out the damn krauts. We fought them almost man for man, and we kicked the sons of bitches out. Maybe that's nothing very lofty to be proud of. But right now, I'm a soldier, and about all I have to be proud of is being part of some good soldiering. And believe me, that was pretty good soldiering. But maybe now you can understand why the letter to Elsa was not very cheerful. Good night, Anton. And that is the end of this segment of this longer story. Uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning, by the way, he refers to Leon and Elsa. Leon was his brother who was serving in the Army in the Pacific. Elsa was his older sister who was back in Rhode Island. So anyway, thank you for your attention. Dr. Amy Latterman. Dr. Latterman is the distinguished is, is the director of the Swamp Research Center in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. She is a distinguished scientist who served on the faculty of the Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Her husband, Ezra Latterman, is a veteran of the Battle of the Bulge and wrote the Leipzig Symphony whilst still at the front. She is with us tonight to tell his story. I've got a very different story to tell, although the same you need a microphone. I'm sorry. Take a mic. Yeah, I think this is it. Yeah. Okay. I have a, a very different story to tell. It's really pretty much the same scene, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Some of you may already know about my husband, Ezra Latterman, from 1989 when he arrived at Yale as the new dean of the School of Music coinciding with the world premiere of his opera, Marilyn, at City Opera in New York City. In other words, he survived the battle. Mm -hmm. Musical audiences around the entire United States already knew him as composer of eight symphonies, a dozen oratorios, operatic, symphonic, and dance works, commissioned by and broadcast on CBS television. In Washington, D.C., he was known as director of music programs at the NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts, and later in intellectual circles as president of the Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Now, I have the privilege of introducing Ezra as a newly recruited GI just out of high school. After his jeep was missing in action in the Black Forest behind enemy lines. After I thought of the few words I thought of, I found his own words written in the program notes of Volume 3, Albany Records CD, The Chamber Music of Ezra Latterman. They plan to release the next two CDs this year in commemoration of what would have been Ezra's 95th year. He lasted through his 90th birthday. 
So these are Ezra Latterman's words, and in that I follow what has been said before, but I don't do it from memory, sorry. <laughs> April 25th, 1943. I was inducted into the Army. I became a radio operator in the field artillery, the 881st Battalion, Battery A of the 69th Division. Our family knew the 69th Division as the Fighting 69th, because Daddy, my children's father, would tell stories about the Fighting 69th. The kinds of stories he told were nothing, nothing, nothing like what we've been hearing now. He didn't tell those stories. A year later, we were in Havisham, England, poised to enter the war. It was here that I learned that my brother Jack, an Air Force pilot, had been shot down and killed in Germany. The Battle of the Bulge, crossing the Rhine at Remagen, liberating Leipzig, meeting the Russians at Torgau on the bank of the Elbe River were the points of this constellation that was filled with tension and waiting, victory and grief. We became aware of the horror and what we now call the Holocaust while freeing Leipzig. I remember his telling me about the ghost-like skeletal figures wandering the streets, which were at first shocking and an unbelievable puzzle. What was this? Prisoners that had just been released, these skeletons. The war in Europe was suddenly over for us, and I, now a technical sergeant, was put in charge of a modest home on the outskirts of the city near the IG Farben chemical plant. We found out later that the home was a scientist being whisked back to the United States before the Russians could nab him. Maybe some of you know some of those stories. I was responsible for six GIs plus Little Hook, an extraordinary Native American, our machine gunner, who lived by his own code. I have to imagine a few things there. In the living room, there was an upright piano and a view to the garden where we could see and be seen. There are stories to that too, but he didn't add it here. I got hold of some music paper and for the next six weeks, wrote the short score to the Leipzig Symphony. And we have some um, visual aids back there, and I think they'll be on the screen as well. We have a, a photograph that one of his buddies must have taken of Ezra sitting there writing. He was a lefty, and you can see he was writing with his left hand, and without his eyeglasses. He wore glasses from the time he was six. His, his glasses were lost all during the war. And, the piece is programmatic. It tells of the preparation, attack, liberation, and finally a prayer concerning the events at Leipzig. The battle lasted 10 days, was initially ferocious, and ended quietly with surrender. That's more or less the programmatic story of the symphony. I told my commanding officer, Lieutenant Redmond, about the work, intrigued. This was not exactly what you expect to hear from one of the guys. He asked me to come by his quarters the following Saturday night, and by the way, I remember him telling me, use the servant's entrance. I felt like Haydn and the Esterhazys, because he had, he had had some education in the high school of music and art. I arrived promptly and found him with a group of officers and fraulines lines I remember as a teenager, strictly forbidden to fraternize with Fraulein's. He didn't write that. I just told him about my memories as a 14-year-old. Finishing their dinner with schnapps. I was the evening's entertainment. I was playing the symphony on the piano. 45 minutes later, as the symphony comes to a gentle close in C major, a bewildered group looked at me bleary-eyed. <laughs> Redmond thanked me and bemusedly suggested that his superior, the captain, would have to hear this. In the succeeding weeks, always on a Saturday night, the show was repeated as I moved up the ladder, always using the rear entrance, finally <laughs> doing my act in front of the commanding officer, General Reinhardt. Now, some of you veterans might remember Patton and Reinhardt, general, generals. 
The general informed me that they were forming the GI Symphony in Paris, and he was ordering Lieutenant Redmond to escort me to Paris, where there was the expertise to let him know if the piece was any good. <laughs> <laughs> On a cold, drizzly, early spring Sunday, we traveled by jeep from Leipzig to Paris. Entering the city at dusk, the lieutenant went to the officer's hotel, and the enlisted, enlisted soldier that's right, went to a pension. Morning came. I pulled open the shade and behaved, beheld through a lattice of leaves the Eiffel Tower, a setting embedded in my mind forever. On to Rue de, 29 Rue de Berry, Berry, headquarters of the Special Services European Theater. There I met Captain Kamala M. Frank and Lieutenant Jane Douglas. They became really friends for life, and I met them. I think that they had a crush on my husband. <laughs> <laughs> they brought me to a piano. And one moment, please. The first movement of the symphony was played. Where is the piano? I think you I'm sorry. The first movement of the piano he played. Uh, they created a post for me at the orchestrator as the orchestrator of the GI Symphony Orchestra, and he sort of laughs at himself all the way through this. I arranged holiday tunes for the band. I mean, he said orchestrator of the GI Symphony. He had this guy who was just, he wasn't 20 yet. Wow. So what did he do? We were housed together with actors and USO performers, Mickey Rooney, who played a terrific game of ping pong, in an old chateau overlooking Malmaison, the home Napoleon built for Josephine. He later brought me back there so I could see the scene. For the following year, first in Paris, then in Frankfurt, life was lived to the fullest. I conducted my symphony in Wiesbaden and then in Metz. Had the piece broadcast over the Armed Forces Network, maybe some of that. Gave piano recitals. He also had his own radio show. He doesn't mention it here. Met wonderful conductors and great American soldier musicians. Some became close, lifelong friends. I spent evenings with Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson and an afternoon with Paul Robeson. He was paraded uh, around as, you know, this is who the GIs really are. And then the bubble burst. Leslie Pearl, the publicist, publicist on leave from his position at the Broadway firm of BBDNO, which you probably don't know of, but BBDNO is a Broadway firm. Suggested, he suggested that we send by courier the score of my symphony to Serge Kusevitsky for an evaluation. <laughs> Lester Schur, a Hollywood agent, was assigned to deliver the score, and he did so to Kusevitsky, Kusevitsky's assistant, Leonard Bernstein. <laughs> Wait. A telegram soon followed from Bernstein to Pearl, the publicist, that read in part, a hope that Latterman will someday develop a musical language that has sophistication. <laughs> Ezra frequently said when they said, you know, this is your first symphony, and Ezra said, no, this was not my first, this was a student work. Of course, by then Ezra was teaching terrific students too. It was time to go home, back to Brooklyn, to my parents. I was discharged on April 22nd, 1946. I was almost 22. It was time to go to college. That's what I have here. a radio intro and just a piece of the symphony now. This is wonderful of you to share that with us. Um, next in the program we have Reverend Susan Izzard.
She's the Minister of Spiritual Life at the First Church of West Hartford, where she assists in the ministry of the church and offers individual spiritual direction to clergy and laity throughout Connecticut. Her focus extends to creating meaningful worship in small group gatherings, such as Taizé services, book studies, labyrinth walks, pilgr pilgrimages, and retreats. She's written a memoir called My Darling Mother, A Soldier's Letters Home, about her father's World War II experiences. She's here tonight to tell her father's story. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. My sweet mother, Anne Skank, asked me if I would come and speak, and sadly today she's quite under the weather with an infection and she can't be here. So if you all know her, uh, she sends her best. Uh, I'm here because I want to tell how my father's story at the Battle of the Bulge actually ended up a little bit as a New Haven story. It's an interesting journey that brought us here and formed the, uh, sort of a background kind of myth as to growing up as a skank daughter on one of, one of five. My father was um, in the Battery B of the 590th Field Artillery Battalion, which was the supporting unit for the 423rd Infantry of the 106th Army. He was part of the group of young men who had been pushed along at Yale, and he graduated a year and a half early so that he could be a, a second lieutenant. He was a field um, forward observer, excuse me, he was a forward observer, and one, a beautiful writer, and one night when he had um, some extra time, he sat at a typewriter at Camp Abernathy, um, and wrote to his parents about what it meant to be a forward observer. I want to repeat again that I'm very lucky to have two very good boys in my section. We're equipped with a jeep and a trailer, a little stove and a set of pots, a five gallon water can, a set of entrenched tools, extra gas cans, a radio, two telephones with five miles of wire, and accessories for laying it out, a big telescope, with which to observe fire, various instruments and survey equipment, and so on. I personally carry on myself a compass, a $200 pair of binoculars, a gas mask, pistols, two extra clips of ammunition, steel helmet, field bag, dispatch case, and so on. So you can see that I'm very loaded down. If I have to do too much walking with the infantry, you can bet I'll get rid of most of it. One of my men is a sergeant. He drives the Jeep. The other is a radio telephone operator and a wireman. Most of the time, they'll be bringing up the, the Jeep and carrying communications, which is the toughest part of the job. A forward observer is no good to anyone if he has no contact. My job splits into two parts. First, to find targets and fire on them. Second, to keep liaison with the forward elements of the infantry we are supporting. I'm supposed to be the eyes and ears of artillery. So most of the time, I will be doing one of two things, either looking for observation posts from which I can fire, or else helping the infantry commander decide how best to use his supporting weapons. As you may be able to see from what I have told you, it is usually an extremely interesting job. I'm completely on my own and can do whatever I want so long as I carry out my mission, with the equipment I've got, I'm pretty well self-sufficient and awful, often will not return to the battery for days at a time. I'm frankly itching to get a chance, but will probably end up the army of occupation. And so he was sent overseas and ended up in the Ardennes um, at the very beginning of the war which we know started on the 16th of December, 1944. He had sent a number of V-mail, as you can see. He was a great writer, and he sent as many letters home as possible. Of course, my grandparents didn't receive most of them until after the war was over, and they had no idea if Dad was alive or not. So a good portion of the box of letters that I used for the paper was my grandmother's own correspondence, trying to figure out if her son was alive. 
after the war, when my father was liberated, and I'm about to tell you that, he wrote a letter home describing the first nights of being uh, on the front. This is December 16th, 1944, that he's telling about. Well, now I've brought you up to date a little on my present condition. I'll go into a little of the news on what happened to me from December to April. As you remember, we arrived on the Siegfried Line about December 13th or so, and my last letter told you what wonderful setup it was for my living comforts. My promotion had gone in. I had just wangled for my driver, my favorite soldier in the battery, and although I guess things were looking too good, I have fired some interesting targets, but none of us had any idea the big attack that was coming from the Germans. One morning, I just awoke to the terrible barrage landing all around and over my pillbox. That was the beginning. The barrage ended and all was quiet on my sector, but you could hear the main attack going on in a little town called Belief. So I left my sergeant in the pillbox with a phone and took off for the battalion headquarters to get permission to go down into town where I could be of some use directing fire. There I learned that my old battery commander, Captain Pitts, had been killed through shell fire. He was the only officer in the battalion who was killed. All the rest were captured. I went into the little town, and in a pretty thrilling counterattack, we drove the Jerrys out. I tasted my first small arms fire, as well as mortar and grenades, and I was scared to death. That night, I stayed at an infantry command post in a building in town. I had my two men with me, and we planned to continue artillery support of the infantry the next day. But that next morning, the Germans attacked with several divisions, including the famous Hermann Goring Division, and easily drove our few companies out of town. I and 12 other men and officers were surrounded in the building for four hours. We really caught hell from every battalion, uh, platoon of Jerry's that went by. I won't try to describe my feelings at this time, and the whole thing is hard to tell on paper. But during a lull, we rushed out, jumped in my Jeep, and took off back to the battalion command post. The Jeep arrived with plenty of holes in it. But I and my crew were okay, except for minor cuts. After that, I thought nothing worse could happen to me. But I hadn't been a prisoner yet. As far as I can tell from the letters and piecing together uh, the US Army history, my father was taken prisoner of war on the 19th of December, 1944. He was either captured or he was part of the group of um, his army that surrendered to the Germans on that date. One of the stories he did tell us as children was that he was marched for a number of hours, long hours, to cattle cars where he stood, packed in, with no food and water um, for a number of days until they got to Berlin. One of the V-mail tells his grandmother, his, my, my grandmother, his mother, that he spent Christmas Day, uh, 1944, he was 21 years old at the time, and a second lieutenant, he sent Christmas Day in a concentration camp. We know from other V-mail in early January that his health is good. He's always telling his mother about his health, uh, what food he's eating, and to make sure that she's collecting his checks from the army. It's very funny. You can tell what he cares about. But he was six foot four, and he was one of the people who lost 60 pounds because of the starvation at the end of the war. But he had deep compassion. He always said that he was lucky he was an officer because he was treated better than others. And he also said that everyone was um, starving, all the Germans and all the prisoners. And uh, so he never had a bitterness in that regard. But anyway, we know that he was hopeful that he would go to a, a prison camp that was directly, excuse me, directly for officers. Um, and he's sending V-mail home in that regard. But then towards the end of January, or early February, he does get sent to Olaf 13B, which is in Hamelburg, Germany, which was an officer's uh, con prison camp. 
And they had an army hospital there. Uh, it was started by the Serbs early in the war when they were captured. And my father at that time was deathly sick. He had a pneumonia and um, malnutrition and dysentery. And he was um, nursed back to life by a Serb by, who was feeding him warm, he called it that dreadful thin soup that the Germans gave them that was filled with worms. And, um, but he was nursed to health by this man who spoon fed my dad. And it was very uh, sad for dad that um, this guy who saved him ended up dying before the end of the war. In March 13th, a number of army officers showed up at my dad's prison camp, one of whom was Colonel John Waters. For those of you who know army history, he was Patton's son-in-law. And everything changed for my dad then, because at the end of March, Patton decided to do something very um, interesting. He put together something called Task Force Bomb, run by Colonel Baum. And he took his top 300 people and 53 vehicles, tanks and jeeps, and he sent these men and uh, uh, cars and jeeps um, forward 100 miles to liberate my father's prison camp in Hamelburg. Now, um, Patton said it was because it was filled with officers. And in fact, he was right about that. He thought there were 500 officers for Allied forces. There are actually 1,300 of them in my father's camp. But others say it was because he wanted his son-in-law liberated. Well, this little unit of Americans made it to my father's camp, and there's wonderful pictures in my grandmother's box of, uh, you know, from the newspaper of the um, tanks pushing down the fences and arriving. And during the arrival, um, Colonel Waters actually gets wounded and ends up back in the hospital that my father had been in. But uh, Ca Captain Baum said to them, if you're a forward observer, you can get onto our tank and we'll feed you. You can't get in because we don't have room. And also they were so sick and you know, covered in, with dysentery that they were risk, couldn't risk letting the other men get sick. So my father got onto the tank, as sick as he was, and he started back towards the front. And by the time they got partway there, the Germans had obviously figured this out, and they surrounded this little unit of men, and they destroyed every vehicle. 23 or so men were killed. Only 30 made it back to the front, and all the rest of them became prisoners of war. Well, my father jumped off the tank and hid in the woods that night, and um, ended up sleeping in a barn, a German barn. And the next morning, he was taken back to the prison camp because the Germans couldn't keep, uh, they had to, for their own sake, had to give him back to the prison camp. But because of that, my father missed getting shipped to Nuremberg along with the other prisoners of war who were still in his unit. And actually, they had to walk, at least if I have the history correct, these prisoners walked to Nuremberg, and during the time of walking, the Allied forces thought that they were Germans, and they broke, bombed them. So a number of my father's colleagues were killed walking by their own uh, Allied forces. But my father was now in prison camp with Colonel Baum, who had been wounded, and Colonel Waters. Two weeks later, Patton pushed the entire front up to my father's prison camp. And he was liberated on the 11th or 12th, of, I think around the 11th, maybe it was the 9th of April, and sent to Vital, France, which was a big, huge uh, hotel, which was a field hospital at that time, the 23rd Field Hospital. I'm getting to the New Haven point. And while he was there, he was nursed back to health by a doctor. And he was in a room with three other officers, and uh, this doctor wrote to my grandparents and actually told him, them, that my father was alive and reported on his health. And my father writes an incredible letter home about what it meant to be free. And this is before he gets, um, uh, they start to censor all the 
the, their, his letters soon after this, but this is one that isn't censored. I think it's because the war hadn't ended, so they were very careful about what the boys said when they were writing home. Dear, and he wrote every letter, my darling mother. So he writes, my darling mother, here I am free to write you again and say what I please. Being a prisoner of war for four months was hard enough for me, but I dread to think of how you must have suffered when you received that telegram missing in action. But it's all over now, and I can say luck in our lives going through regular channels of evacuation to the States, where I should arrive in about a month or two. Sometime in early summer, I receive a 30-day leave, and I imagine we'll have a grand time together. I am well, but very thin, naturally. In this first letter, I won't waste space on German treatment, but it will make your hair stand on end. You cannot write to me. As soon as I can, I will ask for a telegram from you telling, you how, telling me how you are. Naturally, I'm starved for no news of all of you and pray all is well with the family. It's like being reborn, the liberation. Everything is new and full of interest to me, and every old experience is now a new pleasure, from good food to a bath to delousing to a field movie, to a Red Cross girl, and so on, ad infinitum. I will try to find a stamp. I hope you receive my two uh, telegrams, all my love, Nudie. They call him, he's Charles Newton's gang. Okay, really fast. I just want to tell you that uh, after he finished his being at um, the field hospital, the doctor that helped to, to care for him gets sent to Dachau so he can work with the malnourished people in Dachau, just like he did with the officers. And they lose contact with each other. <coughs> My father gets redrafted into the Korean War, but he's gone to law school, and he was a Kent scholar at, at Columbia, and he goes to the Pentagon because they need him there. He was lucky to have a very sharp mind. Where he's picked by General Luke Finley, to be, who was in charge of implementing the Marshall Plan in Paris, to be his secretary. So my dad goes over there and uh, gets introduced to Luke Finley's daughter, and my parents fall in love, they get married, and they live in Paris for a little while, and then they come back to New Haven, where they, my father starts at Wigan and Dana, and my mother delivers her first child, my oldest sister, Sally. Well, while she was in the maternity ward, in this old-fashioned way of doing things, she picked her pediatrician. And then she went home with a baby about two weeks later, and on a Sunday morning, my grandparents had driven up from New Jersey to meet their first grandchild, and there was a knock on the door. Well, it turned out the pediatrician was making a spontaneous visit to see what kind of home this little baby was being raised in. And my father went and answered the door, and there was dead silence. And all of a sudden, there was this great, huge amount of conversation, it turns out that my mother had picked the pediatrician to be our pediatrician, who was the man who saved my father's life in the 23rd Field Hospital. And my grandparents met the man who wrote them and told them that my father was alive. And my father and David, Dr. David Clement, were lifelong friends. And at the very end of Dad's life, David Clement wrote my father the most beautiful letter, thanking him for being such a servant to this city and to our uh, wider community. And both Dr. Clement and my father's papers, some of them anyway, are in the um, Sterling Memorial World War II uh, collection. So thank you so much. I, it was such a privilege. <laughs> so much, Susan. That was awesome. Oh, I'm so privileged to hear the most amazing stories. Thank you. Um, what we're going to set up for now is a...
now I wish I had a good joke to tell them. <laughs> Going to show us how the shells were loaded. <laughs> this is a real shell from, from Belgium. As long as you talk about this, please. It's been a long time. It's been over 75 years. I was a little boy when all this happened, and uh, I managed to forget it in all these years, too. But this particular uh, piece of artillery was in the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, I, I guess I knew someday I was going to be talking to you. <laughs> I was going to have to have something to talk about. So I brought this home with me. And, uh, and Still don't have anything to talk about. <laughs> uh, however, this has been a very fascinating evening. Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening to most of it. And, uh, and it brought back very many memories. Now, I'm sure there were many of you in the audience tonight who were there either in Europe or in Asia. And I am sitting here thinking how grateful I am that we haven't had any more of uh, what happened at that time and that we were sitting here listening to good, peaceful talking instead of the uh, amount of newspaper talk that goes on nowadays that kind of riles people up. And we begin to think differently about different nations and what they should be doing, what we should be doing, and what we should all be pointing towards one thing, living together. And that's, a, that's an art that seems to have been forgotten. And I, well, thanks for the applause, but I only went two years of high school and I had to go to work. So I'm not a great speaker. I'm not uh, uh, pushing for anything right now. I'm just hoping that we live in peace for the rest of my life anyway. And uh, I think that about brings me to a finish, a <laughs> close. But I'll be happy to answer any uh, war <coughs> questions, which is mostly what I know. We're going to have a question and answer session after. Okay. with the entire panel. Captain, is there anything you'd like to add? Well, yes, I'd like to add something very interesting. You're a good speaker, and we hear you clearly. And uh, I have something that I did. I, I didn't do it. Actually, it happened to me on the first day that we fought in a Siegfried line. And on that particular day, uh, we lost three or four of our officers in the first few hours. And they were disgusting. And that being a weapons platoon leader, I said, well, i got to get up there and see what's going on. So I was following the tank tracks because I figured there might be mines all over the place. And first thing I knew, a shell went over my head. I said, well, what was that? It just whistled right by. Then another shell fell maybe short of me, maybe about 80 yards before me. Then I said, wow, this is not good. Then another shell went over, over my head. And another one shell four. So I said, wow, it sounds like 88s. They fired four 88s. They're going to shot up 
four battleships or four bombers, you know, and poor little old me, that must be a pretty hard guy to hit. So what I did, I zigzagged across the field, I jumped into a big bomb crater, and uh, the next thing I knew, another shell fell right next to my edge of my crater. I says, wow, that was close. I says, I better play dead. So I just played dead, and I was there maybe 10 minutes, and I, then I didn't even know whether I was falling asleep or not, but my brother came up to me and says, sir, he says, what are you doing down there? I says, I'm playing dead. He says, guess what, we found this little crowd here in that little tool shed right, right in the corner of that field, and I think he's a radio operator. So all I'm saying is, our poor team really got the worst of it because they had those white stripes on the back of the helmet, and he could see the back of our helmet and knew that was his target. <laughs> and I saved eight eighty-eights because I was a good actor. <laughs> I saved this piece of metal for 75 years, and you know something? I forgot what gauge it is. What <laughs> we in one battle we we uh, used up 125 of these, and and we did it in less than an hour. And I don't know how much damage we did, but we managed to get it off. And so I saved one, so I said, someday I'll talk about, but I don't even remember what, what the size, uh, it's a 75, 105, I don't remember at all. And I'm so happy that I don't. <laughs> I'm a little old for a draft, but who knows? <laughs> Well, I, I got to say another thing about 88s and, and things of that sort, that when we got to the little town of Bejo, and, uh, and I, I happened to walk to, to this barn one night with, with a whole a company of men, and we were actually going through two feet of snow, and it was like 20 below zero, and uh, I, I said, had one thing in mind, I said, we're supposed to see what's at the top of that hill because uh, maybe there might be enemies there. So it was very quiet with all the snow and what have you, and you couldn't hear a pin drop. So I didn't realize at that time, and I found out 20 years later, like he found out 20 years later, that uh, maybe it was more than 20 years, 50 years later, from a gentleman from Saratoga. He says, hey Jim, how you doing? I says, great. I says, weren't you in, uh, weren't you with the, uh, the uh, uh, 333rd that were in Bayo? He said, yes, I was there. I says, what happened that night in Bayo? I, he says, what do you mean? Nothing happened. He says, I went all over town looking for a place to sleep. I says, I couldn't find one place to sleep. The whole town was packed with people. Elbow to elbow and toe to toe and I don't know, maybe head to head, I don't know. But anyway, I, I says, where did you sleep? He said, I did sleep until morning and I finally found a place and that was where? Where? On a washing machine. <laughs> so at that time, I didn't realize there were all those troops that the Germans were waiting with three Tiger tanks uh, between the farm buildings and they were ready to shoot the mission, but we got there before they woke up, and we shoved them out of the barn, and they ran in their tanks and tried to shoot us up, and the field artillery man that came along with us, he says, sir, he says, I think we're done. We gotta give ourselves up. Let's, let us be captives and all that, and save our lives. And then I realized there were 5,000 other lives we had to save. But anyway, he says, we gotta give this up. He shot his radio. I says, what did you do that for? That's order, sir. I says, to my operator, I says, George. I said, look, this guy was in our state, George Karras. 
I says, he's a big heavy guy carrying an SCR radio. And I said, you call up battalion and shoot these numbers. And he says, what? Just, you want to shoot artillery? I said, of course I'm going to shoot artillery. So guess what happened? He, he called battalion. In about five minutes, these big artillery, I think there were one five fires, landed right on the tanks. Thanks for my numbers, you know. I, I was a lucky number. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, a little, few minutes later, I took my field glass, I looked behind me, and I says, wow, look, there's a bunch of men coming this way. They must be our guys, you know. So I said, give me the field glasses. I looked at the guy, and he had a burp gun in front of him. I said, that's not our guys. Those are Germans. I said, get the artillery and shoot this number. And we stopped 400 men from attacking our position. And I got an article there that it shows in our Bridgeport Post about the same date that was uh, in 44, that, that uh, I had saved the, the whole town of Bejo with my action. And uh, so I got what is known as uh, front page headlines about what I did in, in Germany, I mean in Belgium. So guess what? At the same time, this other guy, he, he went through Bataan and saved a lot of American prisoners and, and saved them from the Japanese killing them or something happened. And, and uh, what happened? He, they named the whole highway after him. So the Colonel Mushi Highway is named after him. And I said, Mamma me, I don't even have a, one road name after me. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to move on to the Q&A, so if I can ask our other guests to come up. So the floor is open if anyone has any questions. I'm sitting with all the radio guys. This is just what my husband was doing. He was a radio operator in the field artillery. So the two other representatives are here from the, um, the Signal Corps, in, in effect, is quite amazing. You would have had great talking back and forth and back and forth, and I only can sit and listen. For a minute there, I was getting scared. I was afraid we were going to have a chorus or something. I don't know when he sing. I, I don't know how to sing. Sir, Mr. Pichard, you mentioned that your dad was helped by a family in Luxembourg. Did he ever meet up with them again? Uh, several times after the war, yeah, he went back there. He, he did something which was kind of, oh, sorry. Yeah, he did something which was kind of unusual. Um, he actually stayed in Europe for two years after the war to work for the United Nations Refugee and Displaced Persons Agency. So he was able to stay in contact with them then. Um, not so much later, eventually it broke off, but he stayed in touch with them for a while anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Yes? This is a question for our two veterans. What was it like when you first came home? What did you find? When I first came home? What did you find was difficult? And what did you find was easy? Well, first thing I said was, it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was, oh, I keep forgetting. Uh, I'm so used to uh, being a public speaker. Uh, but when I, I remember coming home and feeling strange walking into my house. Of course, I was, I was single, uh, and I lived uh, with my mother. And of course, they were waiting and waiting, and they had all the neighbors there, and all the, the house was full of people. And I couldn't quite see the, <laughs> I didn't remember half of them, but how happy I was when I got home after those four years. And, uh, but the more I look back on it now, the more I realize it was a war, but I've had memories that I've never forgotten. And uh, 
I went through Europe on somebody else's money, and, and uh, after the war was over, because I was single, and all the married men, they used to send guys home uh, who had, first the first ones who uh, were gone, who were allowed to go home were, were guys with three kids or more, and, which is unfair. And uh, so I, I was single. I was only 24 years old, I think. And I was single. And I say to the last drop, and that didn't feel good, but it was wonderful getting home. I remember the getting home part was really terrific. But uh, I don't re I don't have a, a moment of, I enjoyed my, not the war itself, but my memories now going back to all the things I did during those four years of service that I would never have done had I been home and stayed home. Uh, no being in Europe and, and uh, traveling around and doing all the things we did did me a lot of good in later life. And I really enjoyed my military service. Of course, I lived there. And, uh, poor guys that died didn't enjoy it. And uh, we used to feel real sorry, but uh, it was a saying, we're all sorry uh, for the poor guys that died, but we took of the death that wasn't us. <laughs> and that was being honest. <laughs> Well, I, I got to say that I always was on the move when I was young, and I was a do-it-yourself guy, and I used to make my own wagons and stuff like that, and a lot of times I used to go skating with my skates, you know, and uh, then the guy says, what happened to your skates? He said, did you notice? I made a scooter out of it, you know? So I was going around with a scooter, you know? But we never had a car in our family, so it, it was pretty tough. So a lot of, when I first got started, I kept telling everybody, what are you going to do when you get old? I said, I'm going to college. Well, nobody in our neighborhood goes to college. What's that, you know? I said, I'm going to the University of Connecticut and, uh, and what have you. And so what happened, I was a lucky guy. I didn't have to learn the SATs or the PAS or <laughs> any other things. I, I says, I says, I went there and I says, how do I get into school? They says, I, I, and this was like the, almost at the beginning of the semester. He says, well, all you got to do is pass an intelligence test, you know. And I, I never took an intelligence test, so I, I took the test. He says, wow, you did real good. He <laughs> says, if you want to come, you're admitted, he says. I said, well, thank you, you know. So the, the funny part about this whole thing is we had no car, and I used to hire someone to take me to university because I get 90 miles. And when I didn't see the guy, I used to hitch home, you know, from, from 90 miles away and, uh, and uh, get home faster than people driving there. I don't know how I did it, but I think people liked me to ride with them or something, I don't know. But anyway, one night I got stuck in the city of Hartford. I, it was snowing that night, it was cold and everything, and I got to Hartford, I couldn't get a ride. I said, you know, this is not good. So I thought about going to the railroad station, and guess what? I slept in a nice warm railroad station all night, and I didn't suffer at all. <laughs> so what happened is, when I went, going to school, I didn't even, I was never really home when you come down to work, because when I was, when I came from on vacation, I used to have a job for me, uh, digging 150 tons of, of uh, uh, asphalt, to paving the airport, or I was digging and putting roofs on houses and carrying all that heavy stuff up on the roof, and, uh, and uh, I even almost got killed because one place, one time, doing a lot of sand, all the sand caved in, and they covered everything up, and someone at the bottom knew as I was going down to, 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 to shoot, and <laughs> down the chute, it, it, it was a regular chute. He says, he says, quick, shut the, 
they shut the uh, door at the bottom and, and, the, and the sand kept from going down. So I was up to my nose in sand and I could have died right there. So I, I had a lot of experience that were in close call, so to speak. Is that enough time or you want more? <laughs> but anyway, to make the long story short, I was always working, I was in the post office working during the daytime and I prevailed. I was putting mailbox in the slots at night and all that. I was frankly being the Mr. Mailman and the, and the starter at the same time, you know. So uh, I had a busy summer, then I go to school, and then I went to the Army, so my folks never really saw me because I was always on the road. And when I came back from the war, they says, hey, Jim, where were you? <laughs> I'm kidding you. That was always my dad. We didn't, we didn't even know I was gone. <laughs> Do we have a good question? Is there anybody else? Questions? When were you able to talk about the battles and how what was going on? My dad, I I got the Lottie Da version of you know the Normandy invasion and everything. He didn't talk about any of the bad stuff. She was asking when were you able? Well, both of you, when were you able to talk about the battles? Because growing up, her father was part of Normandy. You want to talk about the battle. When were you able to talk to other people about your experiences it's not, of it's war? Not a fallacy. It's not a fallacy that you... Uh, there are parts of it that I was happy to talk about, and there are parts of it that were sad. I mean, you stop and think it, that uh, and a couple of times you had very close friends uh, I was a sergeant. I had 24 men in my in my group, and uh, we got into one battle and lost several. And to this day, I feel very badly when I talk about it. These were guys that we suffered with, you know, with and being in the army. Sometimes can really be suffering, uh, but you make friends, you, and there's a difference in the, in the friendships that you make when you're in battle and you know that you may lose this guy in a minute, in a minute. Yeah. It, and it happened uh, to me about three times where I didn't, I was just walking, uh, walking with the guns on the shoulder and all of a sudden something happens and you start firing and you, all you're thinking about is me. You're not thinking about your buddy next to you because he's thinking about himself too. But when it's over and you've lost a couple of people, it's a very sad, very hard thing to, uh, you're never going to get used to it, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you have to put up with it. I was in, the, in Europe for uh, about 18 months, which was a long time. And uh, I was very, very lucky too, because uh, for quite some time, my duties were very, very good. I was a sergeant, and I had some very good duties. And then all of a sudden, we find ourselves in, in front of uh, tanks and everything else. I was in tank destroyers, and uh, it, it was a, a, un, a, 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 a unit that was put together only for that war. And as soon as that war was over, it was disbanded. So now when you hear about tank destroyers, uh, when I hear about it, I know that there are no more tank destroyers. And uh, I think back, and I think it was a good idea for them to, to it was too dangerous, yeah. too dangerous. Uh, saying that about a war is really something, <laughs> all of it is dangerous, but some a little more than others. And luck is a big, part of uh, being in the Army. Luck is a, 
a, an amazing part. I know guys who got killed walking down the street and other guys who went through total <coughs> war to the ground because you can't get any further. And you're praying that you're, nothing hits you, no flat, no nothing hits you. That's, okay. Thank that's you. something to be uh, Thank you. About. Thank you. So I hope there'll never be another war. Like some water. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I, I can talk. Thank you. Well, I, I got to say one thing that uh, everybody thinks I'm a company commander and all that, but most of my time with the company at, at home and uh, in, in battle was more like a second in command of the company. So guess what? He had to feed the guys every day. He had to make sure he got out to the foxholes where the guys were in the middle of the night and see that they got their food and all that. So what happened was, <laughs> what happened is, everybody loved when I bought the hot food and, and that's the only food they got. Or if they didn't eat the hot food, they had deep, deep bars, which would break your teeth, or they had that little seat ration, which was interesting if you get the can open and all that. So anyway, one night I was crawling around and someone says, Paul, who goes there? What's the password? I said, oh, I forgot the password. He said, it's okay, Lieutenant Morgan, we, we know it's you. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, the worst part was one night the, the person from battalion that brought the kitchen stuff to us, he came down to us and he, he says, hey, Jim. I says, what happened? I said, I forget, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, uh, he's from Texas. He's, I says, Tex, I says, I said, what happened last night? You didn't bring us the food last time. He said, what do you mean you didn't bring food? He says, we didn't find your marker. What? You didn't find my marker? What do you, what do you mean? Well, I said, I put the toilet paper around the tree, you know? He, he, he says, it must have snowed last night. I said, next time I'm going to make sure I use it first. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to take privilege because I, I want to ask our storytellers a question. How did the discovery of the letters from your fathers or your, um, well, both your fathers change your understanding of your parents? So being one of five daughters, my father um, raised, and he was a Victorian guy in a way, and um, he didn't talk about the war. And he didn't really talk to us that much when I was growing up. He was busy doing New Haven things, and um, my mom was t raising us. And um, so when I found his box and wrote the paper I wrote for my writing group, um, I, I guess I, I got to learn about my father's heart because his, his letter writing home was so beautiful and tender. And I also learned about the enormous respect that they had as people in the war because they were in the box, letters from the president of Yale and his teachers in high school, all writing to his parents, consoling them and telling them about what my father was like as a young man. So it was a wonderful perspective. And, the, and then at the end also, I have to say that I feel brokenhearted that I didn't get to talk to dad about these stories, but he wouldn't talk about those stories. They gave him, at the very end of his life, he was very sick and he couldn't even have an MRI because it was like being in an artillery field. You know, it was like, <laughs> So mom says, this poor man can't even get an MRI because it's too much stress for him. And um, I'm just sorry that he didn't have the, what well, didn't want to talk about it. Um, but I guess I learned about my father's heart. I, um, in a way, I don't think I learned just going to be, have to be qualified. I don't really think I learned all that much about my father. I mean, he was the same person in those letters that I think I pretty much knew. Um, I did learn something about the experiences that he went through, and in a way, I, I look at it as, as a sort of angle into the, you know, 
the experience of the war filtered through the mind of someone who I already had some understanding of, you know, helped me to gain some more understanding of the war and of the pressures that were on him. Just to take one of many examples, he's constantly being pulled back and forth in these letters between badly wanting his parents to understand what he's going through and on the other hand, not wanting to scare the living daylights out of them. And you can see it sometimes even in the same paragraph, you know, go one way and then cut back the other way. Um, yeah, so that's enough. I am astounded he never told me what was in that footlocker before he died, but I don't have a good explanation for that. I learned so much tonight of all that my husband Ezra never said in the 63 years we were married because he never talked about just whether he was holding a microphone or whether he was holding a radio because he was send he was in front of the lines sending the information back that you guys were so smart to know those numbers that's what he was great at, was numbers, and I, I, I'm, the revelations that have been revealed to me tonight, this is something that I'll tell to my kids, all the things that we started to ask each other, was dad in a jeep? My son, my oldest son says no, he was in a truck. I was pretty sure it was a Jeep. Now everybody else was off there with their radios and their wire in Jeep. So now I know that. But then what, what he was carrying with him, he didn't care to tell us those things or he did not wish to give us the details. One thing I did know, and I don't believe I mentioned it, was that Ezra decided to train himself for the Signal Corps. When he got out of high school that summer, he went up to Nova Scotia and trained to learn Morse code, thinking that he was going to be a pianist and he would save his hands. As soon as they were in the battle, the first thing that happened was that his lineman was killed. So Ezra had to go and be a lineman. I didn't know just what that meant. Mm -hmm. I learned a little bit tonight. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for bearing with us. It's been a long program. I hope this has meant something to you. It's meant a great deal to me. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.